Chapter 12 of The Legends of King Arthur and His Knights, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. The Adventures of Sir Lancelot, Sir Percival, and Sir Bors. Then Sir Percival rode back to ask his name of the recluse, but Sir Lancelot went forward on his quest, and following any path his horse would take, he came by and by, after nightfall, to a stone cross hard by an ancient chapel. When he had alighted and tied his horse up to a tree, he went and looked in through the chapel door, which was all ruinous and wasted, and there within he saw an altar richly decked with silk, whereon there stood a fair candlestick of silver bearing six great lights. And when Sir Lancelot saw the light, he tried to get within the chapel, but could find no place. So being passing weary and heavy, he came again to his horse, and when he had unsaddled him and set him free to pasture, he unlaced his helm and ungirded his sword, and laid him down to sleep upon his shield before the cross. And while he lay between waking and sleeping, he saw come by him two white palfreys bearing a litter wherein a sick knight lay, and the palfreys stood still by the cross. Then Sir Lancelot heard the sick man say, O oh, sweet lord, when shall this sorrow leave me, and the holy vessel pass by me, wherethrough I shall be blessed? For I have long endured. With that Sir Lancelot saw the chapel open, and the candlestick with the six tapers come before the cross, but he could see none who bare it. Then came there also a table of silver, and thereon the holy vessel of the Sangreal. And when the sick knight saw that, he sat up, and lifting both his hands said, Fair Lord, sweet Lord, who art here within this holy vessel, have mercy on me, that I might be whole. And therewith he crept upon his hands and knees so nigh that he might touch the vessel, and when he had kissed it, he leaped up and stood and cried aloud, Lord God, I thank thee, for I am made whole. Then the Holy Grail departed with the table and the silver candlestick into the chapel, so that Sir Lancelot saw it no more, nor for his sin's sake could he follow it. And the knight who was healed went on his way. Then Sir Lancelot awake and marvelled whether he had seen aught but a dream. And as he marvelled, he heard a voice saying, Sir Lancelot, thou art unworthy. Go thou hence, and withdraw thee from this holy place. And when he heard that, he was passing heavy, for he bethought him of his sins. So he departed weeping, and cursed the day of his birth, for the words went into his heart, and he knew wherefore he was thus driven forth. Then he went to seek his arms and horse, but could not find them, and then he called himself the wretchedest, and most unhappy of all knights, and said, My sin hath brought me unto great dishonour, for when I sought earthly honours I achieved them ever. But now I take upon me holy things, my guilt doth hinder me, and shameth me. Therefore had I no power to stir or speak when the holy blood appeared before me. So thus he sorrowed till it was day, and he heard the birds sing. Then was he somewhat comforted, and departing from the cross on foot, he came into a wild forest, and to a high mountain, and there he found a hermitage, and kneeling before the hermit down upon both his knees, he cried for mercy for his wicked works, and prayed him to hear his confession. But when he told his name, the hermit marvelled to see him in so sore a case, and said, Sir, ye ought to thank God more than any knight living, for he hath given thee more honour than any, yet for thy presumption, while in deadly sin to come into the presence of his flesh and blood, he suffered thee neither to see nor follow it. Wherefore believe that all thy strength and manhood will avail thee little when God is against thee. And Sir Lancelot wept and said, now know I well ye tell me truth. 
Then he confessed to him, and told him all his sins, and how he had for fourteen years served but Queen Guinevere only, and forgotten God, and done great deeds of arms for her, and not for heaven, and had little or nothing thanked God for the honour that he won. And then Sir Lancelot said, I pray you counsel me. I will counsel thee, said he. Never more enter into that queen's company when ye can avoid it. So Sir Lancelot promised him. Look that your heart and your mouth accord, said the good man, and ye shall have more honour and more nobleness than ever ye have had. Then were his arms and horse restored to him, and so he took his leave and rode forth repenting greatly. Now Sir Percival had ridden back to the recluse to learn who that knight was whom she had called the best in the world. And when he had told her that he was Sir Percival, she made passing great joy of him, for she was his mother's sister, wherefore she opened her door to him and made him good cheer. And on the morrow she told him of her kindred to him, and they both made great rejoicing. Then he asked her who that knight was, and she told him, he it is who on whitsunday last was clad in the red robe and bare the red arms and he hath no peer for he worketh all by miracle and shall be never overcome by any earthly hands by my good will said sir percival i will never after these tidings have to do with sir galahad but in the way of kindness and i would fain learn where i may find him fair nephew said she Ye must ride to the castle of Goth, where he hath a cousin. By him ye may be lodged, and he will teach you the way to go. But if he can tell you no tidings, ride straight to the castle of Carbonek, where the wounded king is lying, for there shall ye surely hear tidings of him. So Sir Percival departed from his aunt and rode till evensong time, when he was ware of a monastery closed round with walls and deep ditches, where he knocked at the gate, and anon was let in. And there he had good cheer that night, and on the morrow heard mass. And beside the altar where the priest stood was a rich bed of silk and cloth of gold, and on the bed there lay a man passing old, having a crown of gold upon his head, and all his body was full of great wounds, and his eyes almost wholly blind, and ever he held up his hands and said, Sweet Lord, forget not me. Then Sir Percival asked one of the brethren who he was. There, said the good man, ye have heard of Joseph of Arimathea how he was sent of Jesus Christ into this land to preach and teach the Christian faith. Now in the city of Saras he converted a king named Evelake, and this is he. He came with Joseph to this land, and ever desired greatly to see the Sangreal. So on a time he came nigh thereto, and was struck almost blind. Then he cried out for mercy, and said, Fair Lord, I pray thee, let me never die, until a good knight of my blood achieve the Sangreal, and I may see and kiss him. When he had thus prayed, he heard a voice that said, Thy prayers be heard and answered, for thou shalt not die till that knight kiss thee, and when he cometh shall thine eyes be opened and thy wounds be healed and now hath he lived here for three hundred winters in a holy life, and men say a certain knight of King Arthur's court shall shortly heal him. Thereat Sir Percival marvelled greatly, for he well knew who that knight should be, and so taking his leave of the monk, departed. Then he rode on till noon, and came into a valley where he met twenty men-at-arms bearing a dead knight on a bier, and they cried to him, Whence comest thou? From King Arthur's court, he answered. Then they all cried together, Slay him, and set upon him. But he smote down the first man to the ground, and his horse upon him, whereat seven of them all at once assailed him, and others slew his horse. Thus he had been either taken or slain, but by good chance Sir Galahad was passing by that way, who, seeing twenty men attacking one, cried, Slay him not! 
and rushed upon them, and as fast as his horse could drive he encountered with the foremost man and smote him down. Then his spear being broken he drew forth his sword and struck out on the right hand and on the left, at each blow smiting down a man till the remainder fled, and he pursued them. Then Sir Percival, knowing that it was Sir Galahad, would fain have overtaken him, but could not, for his horse was slain. Yet followed he on foot as fast as he could go, and as he went there met him a yeoman riding on a palfrey, and leading in his hand a great black steed. So Sir Percival prayed him to lend him the steed that he might overtake Sir Galahad, but he replied, "'That can I not do, fair sir.' for the horse is my master's, and should I lend it, he would slay me. So he departed, and Sir Percival sat down beneath a tree in heaviness of heart, and as he sat, anon a knight went riding past on the black steed which the yeoman had led, and presently after came the yeoman back in haste, and asked Sir Percival if he had seen the knight riding his horse. Yea, said Sir Percival, alas said the yeoman he hath reft him from me by strength and my master will slay me then he besought sir percival to take his hackney and follow and get back his steed so he rode quickly and overtook the knight and cried knight turn again whereat he turned and set his spear and smote sir percival's hackney in the breast so that it fell dead and then went on his way then cried Sir Percival after him, Turn now, false knight, and fight with me on foot. But he would not, and rode out of sight. Then was Sir Percival passing wroth and heavy of heart, and lay down to rest beneath a tree, and slept till midnight. When he awoke, he saw a woman standing by him, who said to him right fiercely, Sir Percival, what doest thou here? I do neither good nor evil, said he. If thou wilt promise me, said she, to do my will whenever I shall ask thee, I will bring thee here a horse that will bear thee wheresoever thou desirest. At that he was full glad, and promised as she asked. Then anon she came again with a great black steed, strong and well apparelled. So Sir Percival mounted, and rode through the clear moonlight, and within less than an hour had gone a four days' journey, till he came to a rough water that roared, and his horse would have borne him into it, but Sir Percival would not suffer him, yet could he scarce restrain him. And seeing the water so furious, he made the sign of the cross upon his forehead, whereat the horse suddenly shook him off, and with a terrible sound leaped into the water and disappeared, the waves all burning up in flames around him. Then Sir Percival knew it was a fiend which had brought him the horse, so he commended himself to God, and prayed that he might escape temptations, and continued in prayer until it was day. Then he saw that he was on a wild mountain nigh surrounded on all sides by the sea, and filled with wild beasts, and going on into a valley he saw a serpent carrying a young lion by the neck with that came another lion crying and roaring after the serpent and anon overtook him and began to battle with him and sir percival helped the lion and drew his sword and gave the serpent such a stroke that it fell dead thereat the lion fawned upon him like a dog licking his hands and crouching at his feet and at night lay down by him and slept at his side. And at noon the next day Sir Percival saw a ship come sailing before a strong wind upon the sea toward him, and he rose and went towards it. And when it came to shore he found it covered with white samite, and on the deck there stood an old man dressed in priest's robes who said, God be with you, fair sir, whence come ye? I am a knight of King Arthur's court, said he, and follow the quest of the Sangreal, but here have I lost myself in this wilderness. Fear nothing, said the old man, for I have come from a strange country to comfort thee. Then he told Sir Percival it was a fiend of hell upon which he had ridden to the sea, and that the lion, whom he had delivered from the serpent, meant the church. 
and Sir Percival rejoiced at these tidings, and entered into the ship, which presently sailed from the shore into the sea. Now when Sir Bors rode forth from Camelot to seek the Sangreal, anon he met a holy man riding on an ass, and courteously saluted him. "'Who are you, son?' said the good man. "'I am a knight,' said he, "'in quest of the Sangreal, and would fain have thy counsel, for he shall have much earthly honour who may bring it to a favourable end.' "'That is truth said the good man, for he shall be the best knight of the world, yet know that none shall gain it save by sinless living. So they rode to his hermitage together, and there he prayed Sir Bors to abide that night, and anon they went into the chapel, and Sir Bors was confessed, and they eat bread and drank water together. Now, said the hermit, I pray thee eat no other food, till thou sit at the table where the Sangreal shall be. Thereto Sir Bors agreed. Also, said the hermit, it were wise that ye should wear a sackcloth garment next to your skin for penance. And in this also did Sir Bors as he was counselled, and afterwards he armed himself and took his leave. Then rode he onwards all that day, and as he rode he saw a passing great bird sit in an old dry tree whereon no leaves were left, and many little birds lay round the great one, nigh dead with hunger. Then did the big bird smite himself with his own bill, and bled till he died amongst his little ones, and they recovered life in drinking up his blood. When Sir Bors saw this, he knew it was a token and rode on full of thought. And about eventide he came to a tower whereto he prayed admission, and he was received gladly by the lady of the castle. But when a supper of many meats and dainties was set before him, he remembered his vow, and bade a squire to bring him water, and therein he dipped his bread and ate. Then the lady said, Sir Bors, I fear ye like not my meat. Yea, truly, said he, God thank thee, madam, but I may eat no other meat this day. After supper came a squire, and said, Madam, bethink thee to provide a champion for thee to-morrow for the tourney, or else shall thy sister have thy castle. At that the lady wept and made great sorrow, but Sir Bors prayed her to be comforted, and asked her why the tournament was held. Then she told him how she and her sister were the daughters of King Aniance, who left them all his lands between them, and how her sister was the wife of a strong knight named Sir Pridan Le Noir, who had taken from herself all her lands save the one tower wherein she dwelt. And now, said she, this also will they take, unless I find a champion by to-morrow. Then said Sir Bors, Be comforted. To-morrow. I will fight for thee. Whereat she rejoiced not a little, and sent word to Sir Pridan that she was provided and ready. And Sir Bors lay on the floor, and in no bed, nor ever would do otherwise, till he had achieved his quest. On the morrow he arose, and clothed himself, and went into the chapel where the lady met him, and they heard mass together. Anon he called for his armour, and went with a goodly company of knights to the battle. And the lady prayed him to refresh himself ere he should fight, but he refused to break his fast until the tournament were done. So they all rode together to the lists, and there they saw the lady's eldest sister, and her husband, Sir Bridan Le Noir, and a cry was made by the heralds that whichever should win, his lady should have all the other's lands. Then the two knights departed asunder a little space, and came together with such force that both their spears were shivered, and their shields and hauberks pierced through, and both fell to the ground sorely wounded with their horses under them. But swiftly they arose, and drew their swords, and smote each other on the head with many great and heavy blows till the blood ran down their bodies, and Sir Pridan was a full good knight, so that Sir Bors had more ado than he had thought for to overcome him. But at last Sir Pridan grew a little faint, that instantly perceived Sir Bors, and rushed upon him the more vehemently, 
and smote him fiercely till he rent off his helm and then gave him great strokes upon his visage with the flat of his sword and bade him yield or be slain and then sir pridan cried him mercy and said for god's sake slay me not and i will never war against thy lady more so sir bors let him go and his wife fled away with all her knights then all those who had held lands of the lady of the tower came and did homage to her again and swore fealty and when the country was at peace sir bors departed and rode forth into a forest until it was midday and there befell him a marvellous adventure for at a place where two ways parted there met him two knights bearing sir lionel his brother all naked bound on a horse and as they rode they beat him sorely with thorns so that the blood trailed down in more than a hundred places from his body but for all this he uttered no word or groan so great he was of heart as soon as sir bors knew his brother he put his spear in rest to run and rescue him but in the same moment heard a woman's voice cry close beside him in the wood saint mary succour thy maid and looking round he saw a damsel whom a felon knight dragged after him into the thickets and she perceiving him cried piteously for help and adjured him to deliver her as he was a sworn knight then was sir bors sore troubled and knew not what to do for he thought within himself if i let my brother be he will be murdered but if i help not the maid she is shamed for ever and my vow compelleth me to set her free wherefore must i first help her and trust my brother unto god so riding to the knight who held the damsel he cried out sir knight lay your hand off that maid or else ye be but dead at that the knight set down the maid and dropped his shield and drew forth his sword against sir bors who ran at him and smote him through both shield and shoulder and threw him to the earth and when he pulled his spear forth the knight swooned then the maid thanked sir bors heartily and he set her on the knight's horse and brought her to her men-at-arms who presently came riding after her and they made much joy and besought him to come to her father a great lord and he should be right welcome but truly said he i may not at this time for i have a great adventure yet to do and commending them to god he departed in great haste to find his brother so he rode seeking him by the track of the horses a great while anon he met a seeming holy man riding upon a strong black horse and asked him had he seen pass by that way a knight led bound and beaten with thorns by two others yea truly such an one i saw said the man but he is dead and lo his body is hard by in a bush and then he showed him a newly slain body lying in a thick bush which seemed indeed to be sir lionel then made sir bors such a mourning and sorrow that by and by he fell into a swoon upon the ground and when he came to himself again he took the body in his arms and put it on his horse's saddle and bore it to a chapel hard by and would have buried it but when he made the sign of the cross he heard a full great noise and cry as though all the fiends of hell had been about him and suddenly the body and the chapel and the old man vanished all away then he knew that it was the devil who had thus beguiled him and that his brother yet lived then held he up his hands to heaven and thanked god for his own escape from hurt and rode onwards and anon as he passed by an hermitage in a forest he saw his brother sitting armed by the door and when he saw him he was filled with joy and lighted from his horse and ran to him and said fair brother when came ye hither but sir lionel answered with an angry face what vain words be these when for you i might have been slain did ye not see me bound and led away to death and left me in that peril to go succouring a gentlewoman the like whereof no brother ever yet hath done now for thy false misdeed i do defy thee and ensure thee speedy death 
Then Sir Bors prayed his brother to abate his anger, and said, Fair brother, remember the love that should be between us twain. But Sir Lionel would not hear, and prepared to fight, and mounted his horse, and came before him, crying, Sir Bors, keep thee from me, for I shall do to thee as a felon and a traitor. Therefore start upon thy horse, for if thou wilt not, I will run upon thee as thou standest. But for all his words, Sir Bors would not defend himself against his brother. And anon the fiend stirred up Sir Lionel to such rage that he rushed over him and overthrew him with his horse's hooves, so that he lay swooning on the ground. Then would he have rent off his helm and slain him, but the hermit of that place ran out and prayed him to forbear, and shielded Sir Bors with his body. Then Sir Lionel cried out, now god so help me sir priest but i shall slay thee else thou depart and him too after thee and when the good man utterly refused to leave sir bors he smote him on the head until he died and then he took his brother by the helm and unlaced it to have stricken off his head and so he would have done but suddenly was pulled off backward by a knight of the round table who by the will of heaven was passing by that place Sir Colgrevance by name. Sir Lionel, he cried, will you slay your brother, one of the best knights of all the world? That ought no man to suffer. Why, said Sir Lionel, will you hinder me and meddle in this strife? Beware, lest I shall slay both thee and him. And when Sir Colgrevance refused to let them be, Sir Lionel defied him and gave him a great stroke through the helmet. Whereat Sir Colgrevance drew his sword, and smote again right manfully, and so long they fought together that Sir Bors awoke from his swoon, and tried to rise and part them, but had no strength to stand upon his feet. Anon Sir Colgrevance saw him, and cried out to him for help, for now Sir Lionel had nigh defeated him. When Sir Bors heard that, he struggled to his feet, and put his helmet on, and took his sword, but before he could come to him, Sir Lionel had smitten off Sir Colgrevance's helm, and thrown him to the earth, and slain him. Then turned he to his brother as a man possessed by fiends, and gave him such a stroke as bent him nearly double. But still Sir Bors prayed him for God's sake to quit that battle, for if it befall us that we either slew the other, we should die for care of that sin never will i spare thee if i master thee cried out sir lionel then sir bors drew his sword all weeping and said now god have mercy on me though i defend my life against my brother and with that he lifted up his sword to strike but suddenly he heard a mighty voice put up thy sword sir bors and flee or thou shalt surely slay him and then there fell upon them both a fiery cloud which flamed and burned their shields, and they fell to the earth in sore dread. Anon Sir Bors rose to his feet, and saw that Sir Lionel had taken no harm. And then came the voice again, and said, Sir Bors, go hence, and leave thy brother, and ride thou forward to the sea, for there Sir Percival abideth thee. Then he said to his brother, Brother, forgive me all my trespass against thee. And Sir Lionel answered, God forgive it thee, as I do. Then he departed and rode to the sea, and on the strand he found a ship all covered with white samite, and as soon as he had entered therein too, it put forth from the shore. And in the midst of the ship there stood an armed knight, whom he knew to be Sir Percival. Then they rejoiced greatly over each other, and said, We lack nothing now but the good knight Sir Galahad. End of Part 2 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 12 of The Legends of King Arthur and His Knights Part 3 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 the Sangrael is achieved, the death of Sir Galahad. Now when Sir Galahad had rescued Sir Percival from the twenty knights, he rode into a vast forest, 
and after many days it befell that he came to a castle where it was a tournament, and the knights of the castle were put to the worse, which when he saw he set his spear in rest and ran to help them, and smote down many of their adversaries. And as it chanced, Sir Gawain was amongst the stranger knights, and when he saw the white shield with the red cross, he knew it was Sir Galahad, and proffered to joust with him. So they encountered, and having broken their spears, they drew their swords, and Sir Galahad smote Sir Gawain so sorely on the helm that he clove it through, and struck on, slanting to the earth, carving the horse's shoulder in twain, and Sir Gawain fell to the earth. Then Sir Galahad beat back all who warred against the castle, yet would he not wait for thanks, but rode away that no man might know him. And he rested that night at a hermitage, and when he was asleep he heard a knocking at the door, so he rose and found a damsel there who said, Sir Galahad, I will that ye arm you, and mount upon your horse, and follow me, for I will show you within these three days the highest adventure that ever any knight saw. Anon Sir Galahad armed him, and took his horse, and commended himself to God, and bade the gentlewoman go, and he would follow where she liked. So they rode onward to the sea, as fast as their horses might gallop, and at night they came to a castle in a valley, enclosed by running water, and by strong and high walls wherein too they entered, and had great cheer, for the lady of the castle was the damsel's mistress. And when he was unarmed, the damsel said to her lady, Madam, shall we abide here this night? Nay, said she, but only till he hath dined and slept a little. So he ate and slept a while, till the maid called him and armed him by torchlight. And when he had saluted the lady of the castle, the damsel and Sir Galahad rode on. Anon they came to the seaside, and lo, the ship wherein were Sir Percival and Sir Bors abode by the shore. Then they cried, Welcome, Sir Galahad, for we have awaited thee long. Then they rejoiced to see each other, and told of all their adventures and temptations, and the damsel went into the ship with them, and spake to Sir Percival. Sir Percival, know ye not who I am? And he replied, Nay, certainly I know thee not. Then said she, I am thy sister, the daughter of King Pellinore, and am sent to help thee and these knights thy fellows to achieve the quest which ye all follow. So Sir Percival rejoiced to see his sister, and they departed from the shore. And after a while they came upon a whirlpool where their ship could not live. Then saw they another greater ship hard by, and went towards it but saw neither man nor woman therein, and on the end of it these words were written, Thou who shalt enter me, beware that thou be in steadfast belief, for I am faith, and if thou doubtest, I cannot help thee. Then were they all adread, but commending themselves to God, they entered in. As soon as they were on board, they saw a fair bed, whereon lay a crown of silk, and at the foot was a fair and rich sword drawn from its scabbard half a foot and more. The pommel was of precious stones of many colours, every colour having a different virtue, and the scales of the haft were of two ribs of different beasts. The one was bone of a serpent from Caledon Forest, named the Serpent of the Fiend, and its virtue saveth all men who hold it from weariness. The other was of a fish that haunteth the floods of Euphrates, named Ertanax, and its virtue causeth whoever holdeth it to forget all other things, whether of joy or pain, save the thing he seeth before him. In the name of God, said Sir Percival, I shall assay to handle this sword, and set his hand to it, but could not grasp it. By my faith, said he, now have I failed. Sir Bors set his hand to it, and failed also. Then came Sir Galahad, and saw these letters written red as blood, None shall draw me forth, save the hardiest of all men, but he that draweth me shall never be shamed or wounded to death. By my faith, said Sir Galahad, I would draw it forth, 
but dare not try ye may try safely said the gentlewoman sir percival's sister for be ye well assured the drawing of this sword is forbid to all but you for this was the sword of david king of israel and solomon his son made for it this marvellous pommel and this wondrous sheath and laid it on this bed till thou shouldst come and take it up and though before thee some have dared to raise it yet have they all been maimed or wounded for their daring where said sir galahad shall we find a girdle for it fair sir said she dismay you not and therewith took from out a box a girdle nobly wrought with golden thread set full of precious stones and with a rich gold buckle this girdle lords said she is made for the most part of mine own hair which while i was yet in the world i loved full well but when i knew that this adventure was ordained me i cut off and wove as ye now see then they all prayed sir galahad to take the sword and so anon he gripped it in his fingers and the maiden girt it round his waist saying now reck i not though i die for i have made thee the worthiest knight of all the world fair damsel said sir galahad ye have done so much that i shall be your knight all the days of my life then the ship sailed a great way on the sea and brought them to land near the castle of carte louise when they were landed came a squire and asked them be ye of king arthur's court we are said they in an evil hour are ye come said he and went back swiftly to the castle within a while they heard a great horn blow and saw a multitude of well-armed knights come forth who bade them yield or die at that they ran together and sir percival smote one to the earth and mounted his horse and so likewise did sir bors and sir galahad and soon had they routed all their enemies and alighted on foot and with their swords slew them downright and entered into the castle then came there forth a priest to whom sir galahad kneeled and said in sooth good father i repent me of this slaughter but we were first assailed or else it had not been repent ye not said the good man for if ye lived as long as the world lasted ye could do no better deed for these were all the felon sons of a good knight earl hernox whom they have thrown into a dungeon and in his name have slain priests and clerks and beat down chapels far and near then sir galahad prayed the priest to bring him to the earl who when he saw sir galahad cried out long have i awaited for thy coming and now i pray thee hold me in thine arms that i may die in peace and therewith when sir galahad had taken him in his arms his soul departed from his body then came a voice in the hearing of them all depart now sir galahad and go quickly to the maimed king for he hath long abided to receive health from thy hand so the three knights departed and sir percival's sister with them and came to a vast forest and saw before them a white hart exceeding fair led by four lions and marvelling greatly at that sight they followed anon they came to a hermitage and a chapel whereunto the hart entered and the lions with it then a priest offered mass and presently they saw the hart change into the figure of a man most sweet and comely to behold and the four lions also changed and became a man an eagle a lion and an ox and suddenly all those five figures vanished without sound then the knights marvelled greatly and fell upon their knees and when they rose they prayed the priest to tell them what that sight might mean what saw ye sirs said he for i saw nothing then they told him ah lords said he ye are full welcome now know i well ye be the knights who shall achieve the sangreal for unto them alone such mysteries are revealed 
the heart ye saw is one above all men white and without blemish and the four lions with him are the four evangelists when they heard that they heartily rejoiced and thanking the priest departed anon as they passed by a certain castle an armed knight suddenly came after them and cried out to the damsel by the holy cross ye shall not go till ye have yielded to the custom of the castle let her go said sir percival for a maiden wheresoever she cometh is free whatever maiden passeth here replied the knight must give a dishful of her blood from her right arm it is a foul and shameful custom cried sir galahad and both his fellows and sooner will we die than let this maiden yield thereto then shall ye die replied the knight and as he spake there came out from a gate hard by ten or twelve more and encountered with them running upon them vehemently with a great cry but the three knights withstood them and set their hands to their swords and beat them down and slew them at that came forth a company of threescore knights all armed fair lord said sir galahad have mercy on yourselves and keep from us nay fair lords they answered rather be advised by us and yield ye to our custom it is an idle word said galahad in vain ye speak it well said they will ye die we be not come thereto as yet replied sir galahad then did they fall upon each other and sir galahad drew forth his sword and smote on the right hand and on the left and slew so mightily that all who saw him thought he was a monster and no earthly man and both his comrades helped him well and so they held the field against that multitude till it was night then came a good knight forward from the enemy and said fair knights abide with us to-night and be right welcome by the faith of our bodies as we are true knights to-morrow ye shall rise unharmed and meanwhile maybe ye will of your own accord accept the custom of the castle when ye know it better so they entered and alighted and made great cheer anon they asked them whence that custom came the lady of this castle is a leper said they and can be no way cured save by the blood of a pure virgin and a king's daughter therefore to save her life are we her servants bound to stay every maid that passeth by and try if her blood may not cure our mistress then said the damsel take ye of my blood as much as ye will if it may avail your lady and though the three knights urged her not to put her life in that great peril she replied if i die to heal another's body i shall get health to my soul and would not be persuaded to refuse so on the morrow she was brought to the sick lady and her arm was bared and a vein thereof was opened and the dish filled with her blood then the sick lady was anointed therewith and anon she was whole of her malady with that sir percival's sister lifted up her hand and blessed her saying madam i am come to my death to make you whole for god's love pray for me and thus saying she fell down in a swoon then sir galahad sir percival and sir bors started to lift her up and staunch her blood but she had lost too much to live so when she came to herself she said to sir percival fair brother i must die for the healing of this lady and now i pray thee bury me not here but when i am dead put me in a boat at the next haven and let me float at venture on the sea and when ye come to the city of saras to achieve the sangreal ye shall find me waiting by a tower and there i pray thee bury me for there shall sir galahad and ye also be laid thus having said she died then sir percival wrote all the story of her life and put it in her right hand and so laid her in a barge and covered it with silk and the wind arising drove the barge from land and all the knights stood watching it till it was out of sight 
Anon they returned to the castle, and forthwith fell a sudden tempest of thunder and lightning and rain, as if the earth were broken up, and half the castle was thrown down. Then came a voice to the three knights, which said, Depart ye now asunder, till ye meet again where the maimed king is lying. So they parted, and rode diverse ways. Now after Sir Launcelot had left the hermit, he rode a long while till he knew not whither to turn, and so he lay down to sleep, if haply he might dream whither to go. And in his sleep a vision came to him, saying, Launcelot, rise up and take thine armor, and enter the first ship that thou shalt find. When he awoke, he obeyed the vision, and rode till he came to the seashore, and found there a ship without sails or oars, and as soon as he was in it he smelt the sweetest savour he had ever known, and seemed filled with all things he could think of or desire. And looking round he saw a fair bed, and thereon a gentlewoman lying dead, who was Sir Percival's sister. And as Sir Launcelot looked on her he spied the writing in her right hand, and taking it he read therein her story, and more than a month thereafter he abode in that ship, and was nourished by the grace of heaven, as Israel was fed with manna in the desert. And on a certain night he went ashore to pass the time, for he was somewhat weary, and listening, he heard a horse come toward him, from which a knight alighted, and went up into the ship, who, when he saw Sir Launcelot, said, Fair sir, ye be right welcome to mine eyes, for I am thy son Galahad, and long time have I sought for thee. With that he kneeled and asked his blessing, and took off his helm and kissed him, and the great joy there was between them no tongue can tell. Then for half a year they dwelt together in the ship, and served God night and day with all their powers, and went to many unknown islands where none but wild beasts haunted, and there found many strange and perilous adventures. And upon a time they came to the edge of a forest before a cross of stone, and saw a knight armed all in white, leading a white horse. Then the knight saluted them, and said to Galahad, Ye have been long time enough with your father. Now therefore leave him and ride this horse till ye achieve the holy quest. Then went Sir Galahad to his father, and kissed him full courteously, and said, Fair father, I know not when I shall see thee again. And as he took his horse, a voice spake in their hearing, Ye shall meet no more in this life. Now my son, Sir Galahad, said Sir Launcelot, since we must so part and see each other never more, I pray the High Father of Heaven to preserve both you and me. Then they bade farewell, and Sir Galahad entered the forest, and Sir Launcelot returned to the ship, and the wind rose and drove him more than a month through the sea, whereby he slept but little, yet ever prayed that he might see the Sangreal. So it befell upon a certain midnight, the moon shining clear, he came before a fair and rich castle, whereof the postern gate was open towards the sea, and having no keeper save two lions in the entry. Anon Sir Launcelot heard a voice, Leave now thy ship, and go within the castle, and thou shalt see a part of thy desire. Then he armed, and went toward the gate, and coming to the lions he drew out his sword, but suddenly a dwarf rushed out and smote him on the arm, so that he dropped his sword, and heard again the voice, O man of evil faith and poor belief, wherefore trustest thou thine arms above thy maker? Then he put up his sword, and signed the cross upon his forehead, and so passed by the lions without hurt. And going in he found a chamber with the door shut, which in vain he tried to open, and listening thereat he heard a voice within, which sang so sweetly that it seemed no earthly thing. Joy and honour be to the Father of Heaven. And then he kneeled down at the door, for he knew well the Sangreal was there within. 
Anon the door was opened without hands, and forthwith came thereout so great a splendour as if all the torches of the world had been alight together. But when he would have entered in, a voice forbade him, wherefore he drew back and looked, standing upon the threshold of the door, and there he saw a table of silver and the holy vessel covered with red samites, and many angels round it holding burning candles, and a cross, and all the ornaments of the altar. Then a priest stood up and offered mass, and when he took the vessel up he seemed to sink beneath that burden. At that Sir Lancelot cried, O oh, father, take it not for sin that I go in to help the priest who hath much need thereof. So saying, he went in. But when he came towards the table, he felt a breath of fire, which issued out therefrom, and smote him to the ground, so that he had no power to rise. Then felt he many hands about him, which took him up, and laid him down outside the chapel door. There lay he in a swoon all through that night, and on the morrow certain people found him senseless, and bore him to an inner chamber, and laid him on a bed and there he rested, living, but moving no limbs, twenty-four days and nights. On the twenty-fifth day he opened his eyes and saw those standing round, and said, Why have ye waked me? For I have seen marvels that no tongue can tell, and more than any heart can think. Then he asked where he was, and they told him, In the castle of Carbonek. "'Tell your lord, King Pelles, said he, "'that I am Sir Lancelot. "'At that they marvelled greatly, "'and told their lord it was Sir Lancelot "'who had lain there so long. "'Then was King Pelles wondrous glad, "'and went to see him, "'and prayed him to abide there for a season. "'But Sir Lancelot said, "'I know well that I have now seen "'as much as mine eyes may behold "'of the Sangreal.' wherefore I will return to my own country. So he took leave of King Pelles, and departed towards Logris. Now after Sir Galahad had parted from Sir Lancelot, he rode many days till he came to the monastery where the blind King Evelake lay, whom Sir Percival had seen. And on the morrow, when he had heard mass, Sir Galahad desired to see the king, who cried out, Welcome, Sir Galahad! servant of the lord long have i abided thy coming take me now in thine arms that i may die in peace at that sir galahad embraced him and when he had so done the king's eyes were opened and he said fair lord jesus suffer me now to come to thee and anon his soul departed then they buried him royally as a king should be and sir galahad went on his way Within a while he came to a chapel in a forest, in the crypt whereof he saw a tomb which always blazed and burnt, and asking the brethren what that might mean, they told him, Joseph of Arimathea's son did found this monastery, and one who wronged him hath lain here these three hundred and fifty years, and burneth evermore, until that perfect knight who shall achieve the Sangreal doth quench the fire then said he i pray ye bring me to the tomb and when he touched the place immediately the fire was quenched and a voice came from the grave and cried thanks be to god who now hath purged me of my sin and draweth me from earthly pains into the joys of paradise then sir galahad took the body in his arms and bore it to the abbey and on the morrow put it in the earth before the high altar. Anon he departed from thence, and rode five days in a great forest, and after that he met Sir Percival, and a little further on Sir Bors. When they had told each other their adventures, they rode together to the castle of Carbonek, and there King Pelles gave them hearty welcome, for he knew they should achieve the holy quest. As soon as they were come into the castle, a voice cried in the midst of the chamber, Let them who ought not now to sit at the table of the Lord rise and depart hence. 
Then all save those three knights departed. Anon they saw other knights come in with haste at the hall doors and take their harness off, who said to Sir Galahad, Sir, we have tried sore to be with you at this table. Ye be welcome, said he, but whence are ye? So three of them said they were from Gaul, and three from Ireland, and three from Denmark. Then came forth the likeness of a bishop with a cross in his hand, and four angels stood by him, and a table of silver was before them, whereon was set the vessel of the Sangreal. Then came forth other angels also, two bearing burning candles, and the third a towel, and the fourth a spear which bled marvellously the drops wherefrom fell into a box he held in his left hand. Anon the bishop took the wafer up to consecrate it, and at the lifting up they saw the figure of a child whose visage was as bright as any fire which smote itself into the midst of the wafer and vanished, so that all saw the flesh made bread. Thereat the bishop went to Galahad, and kissed him, and bade him go and kiss his fellows, and said, now, servants of the Lord, prepare for food such as none ever yet were fed with since the world began. With that he vanished, and the knights were filled with a great dread, and prayed devoutly. Then saw they come forth from the holy vessel the vision of a man bleeding all openly, whom they knew well by the tokens of his passion for the Lord himself. At that they fell upon their faces and were dumb. Anon he brought the holy grail to them, and spake high words of comfort, and when they drank therefrom, the taste thereof was sweeter than any tongue could tell or heart desire. Then a voice said to Galahad, Son, with this blood which drippeth from the spear, anoint thou the maimed king and heal him. And when thou hast this done, depart hence with thy brethren in a ship that ye shall find, and go to the city of Saras, and bear with thee the holy vessel, for it shall no more be seen in the realm of Logris. At that Sir Galahad walked to the bleeding spear, and therefrom anointing his fingers, went out straight away to the maimed king Pelles, and touched his wound. Then suddenly he uprose from his bed as whole a man as ever he was, and praised God passing thankfully with all his heart. Then Sir Galahad, Sir Bors, and Sir Percival departed, as they had been told, and when they had ridden three days they came to the seashore and found the ship awaiting them. Therein they entered, and saw in the midst the silver table, and the vessel of the Sangreal covered with red Samite. Then were they passing glad, and made great reverence thereto. And Sir Galahad prayed that now he might leave the world and pass to God, and presently the while he prayed a voice said to him, Galahad, thy prayer is heard, and when thou askest the death of the body thou shalt have it, and find the life of thy soul but while they prayed and slept the ship sailed on and when they woke they saw the city of saras before them and the other ship wherein was sir percival's sister then the three knights took up the holy table and the sangreal and went into the city and there in a chapel they buried sir percival's sister right solemnly now at the gate of the town they saw an old cripple sitting, whom Sir Galahad called to help them bear their weight. Truly, said the old man, it is ten years since I have gone a step without these crutches. Care ye not, said Sir Galahad, rise now and show good will. So he essayed to move, and found his limbs as strong as any man's might be, and running to the table helped to carry it. Anon there rose a rumour in the city that a cripple had been healed by certain marvellous strange knights, but the king, named Esturans, who was a heathen tyrant, when he heard thereof, took Sir Galahad and his fellows, and put them in prison in a deep hole. Therein they abode a great while, 
but ever the sangreal was with them and fed them with marvellous sweet food so that they fainted not but had all joy and comfort they could wish at the year's end the king fell sick and felt that he should die then sent he for the three knights and when they came before him prayed their mercy for his trespasses against them so they forgave him gladly and anon he died then the chief men of the city took counsel together who should be king in his stead and as they talked a voice cried in their midst choose ye the youngest of the three knights king esturans cast into prison for your king at that they sought sir galahad and made him king with the assent of all the city and else they would have slain him but within a twelve month came to him upon a certain day as he prayed before the sangreal a man in likeness of a bishop with a great company of angels round about him who offered mass and afterwards called to sir galahad come forth thou servant of the lord for the time hath come thou hast desired so long then sir galahad lifted up his hands and prayed now blessed lord would i no longer live if it might please thee anon the bishop gave him the sacrament and when he had received it with unspeakable gladness he said who art thou father i am joseph of arimathea answered he whom our lord hath sent to bear thee fellowship when he heard that sir galahad went to sir percival and sir bors and kissed them and commended them to god saying salute for me sir lancelot my father and bid him remember this unstable world therewith he kneeled down and prayed and suddenly his soul departed and a multitude of angels bare it up to heaven then came a hand from heaven and took the vessel and the spear and bare them out of sight since then was never man so hardy as to say that he had seen the sangreal and after all these things sir percival put off his armour and betook him to an hermitage and within a little while passed out of this world and sir bors when he had buried him beside his sister returned weeping sore for the loss of his two brethren to king arthur at camelot End of Chapter 12. Recording by Thomas Rose. Chapter 13 of The Legends of King Arthur and His Knights by James Knowles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Sir Lancelot and the Fair Maid of Astolat now after the quest of the sangreal was fulfilled and all the knights who were left alive were come again to the round table there was great joy in the court and passing glad were king arthur and queen guinevere to see sir lancelot and sir bors for they had been long absent in that quest and so greatly was sir lancelot's fame now spread abroad that many ladies and damsels daily resorted to him and besought him for their champion and all right quarrels did he gladly undertake for the pleasure of our lord christ and always as much as he might he withdrew him from the queen wherefore queen guinevere who counted him for her own knight grew wroth with him and on a certain day she called him to her chamber and said thus sir lancelot i daily see thy loyalty to me doth slack for ever thou art absent from this court and takest other ladies quarrels on thee more than ever thou wert wont now do i understand thee false knight and therefore shall i never trust thee more depart now from my sight and come no more within this court upon pain of thy head with that she turned from him and would hear no excuses so sir lancelot departed in heaviness of heart and calling sir bors sir ector and sir lionel he told them how the queen had dealt with him fair sir replied sir bors remember what honour ye have in this country and how ye are called the noblest knight in the world wherefore go not for women are hasty and do often what they sore repent of afterwards be ruled by my advice 
Take horse, and ride to the hermitage beside Windsor, and there abide till I send ye better tidings. To that Sir Lancelot consented, and departed with a sorrowful countenance. Now when the queen heard of his leaving, she was inwardly sorry, but made no show of grief, bearing a proud visage outwardly. And on a certain day she made a costly banquet to all the knights of the round table to show she had as great joy in all others as in Sir Lancelot. And at the banquet were Sir Gawain and his brothers, Sir Agravain, Sir Gaheris, and Sir Gareth, also Sir Modred, Sir Bors, Sir Blamor, Sir Bleobaris, Sir Ector, Sir Lionel, Sir Palamedes, Sir Mador de la Porte, and his cousin, Sir Patrice, a knight of Ireland, Sir Pinel le Savage, and many more. Now Sir Pinel hated Sir Gawain, because he had slain one of his kinsmen by treason, and Sir Gawain had a great love for all kinds of fruit, which when Sir Pinel knew, he poisoned certain apples that were set upon the table, with intent to slay him. And so it chanced as they ate and made merry, Sir Patrice, who sat next to Sir Gawain, took one of the poisoned apples and eat it. And when he had eaten, he suddenly swelled up and fell down dead. At that every knight leaped from the board, ashamed and in rage nigh out of their wits, for they knew not what to say, yet seeing that the queen had made the banquet, they all had suspicion of her. "'My lady the queen,' said Sir Gawain, "'I wit well this fruit was meant for me, for all men know my love for it, and now had I been nearly slain, wherefore I fear me ye will be ashamed.' "'This shall not end so,' cried Sir Mador de la Porte. "'Now have I lost a noble knight of my own blood, "'and for this despite and shame I will be revenged to the uttermost.' "'Then he challenged Queen Guinevere concerning the death of his cousin, "'but she stood still, sore abashed, "'and anon with her sorrow and dread she swooned. At the noise and sudden cry came in King Arthur, and to him appealed Sir Mador, and impeached the queen. "'Fair lords,' said he, "'full sorely am I troubled at this matter, for I must be rightful judge, and therein it repenteth me I may not do battle for my wife, for as I deem this deed was none of hers. But I suppose she will not lack a champion.' and some good knight surely will put his body in jeopardy to save her. But all who had been bidden to the banquet said they could not hold the queen excused or be her champions, for she had made the feast, and either by herself or servants must it have come. Alas, said the queen, I made this dinner for a good intent and no evil, so God help me in my need. My lord the king, said Sir Mador, I require you heartily, as you be a righteous king, give me a day when I may have justice. Well, said the king, I give ye this day fifteen days, when ye shall be ready and armed in the meadow beside Westminster. And if there be a knight to fight with you, God speed the right. And if not, then must my queen be burnt. When the king and queen were alone together, he asked her how this case befell. "'I wot not how, or in what manner,' answered she. "'Where is Sir Lancelot?' said King Arthur, "'for he would not grudge to do battle for thee.' "'Sir,' said she, "'I cannot tell you. But all his kinsmen deem he is not in this realm.' "'These be sad tidings,' said the king. "'I counsel you to find Sir Bors, and pray him for Sir Lancelot's sake.' to do this battle for you. So the queen departed, and sent for Sir Bors to her chamber, and besought his succour. Madam, said he, what would you have me do? For I may not with my honour take this matter on me. For I was at that same dinner, and all the other knights would have me ever in suspicion. Now do you miss Sir Lancelot, for he would not have failed you in right, nor yet in wrong, as ye have often proved. "'But now ye have driven him from the country.' "'Alas, fair knight,' said the queen, "'I put me wholly at your mercy, "'and all that is done amiss "'I will amend as ye will counsel me.' "'And therewith 
she kneeled down upon both her knees before Sir Bors, and besought him to have mercy on her. Anon came in King Arthur also, and prayed him of his courtesy to help her, saying, I require you for the love of Lancelot. My lord, said he, ye require the greatest thing of me that any man can ask, for if I do this battle for the queen, I shall anger all my fellows of the table round. Nevertheless, for my lord Sir Lancelot's sake, and for yours, I will that day be the queen's champion, unless there chance to come a better knight than I am to do battle for her. And this he promised on his faith. Then were the king and queen passing glad, and thanked him heartily, and so departed. But Sir Bors rode in secret to the hermitage where Sir Lancelot was, and told him all these tidings. "'It has chanced as I would have it,' said Sir Lancelot. "'Yet make ye ready for the battle, but tarry till ye see me come.' "'Sir,' said Sir Bors, "'doubt not, but ye shall have your will.' But many of the knights were greatly wroth with him when they heard he was to be the queen's champion, for there were few in the court but deemed her guilty. Then said Sir Bors, Wit ye well, fair lords, it were a shame to us all to suffer so fair and noble a lady to be burnt for lack of a champion, for ever hath she proved herself a lover of good knights, wherefore I doubt not she is guiltless of this treason. At that some were well pleased, but others rested passing wroth. And when the day was come, the king and queen, and all the knights, went to the meadow beside Westminster where the battle should be fought. Then the queen was put in ward, and a great fire was made round the iron stake where she must be burnt if Sir Mador won the day. So when the heralds blew, Sir Mador rode forth, and took oath that Queen Guinevere was guilty of Sir Patrice's death, and his oath he would prove with his body against any who would say the contrary. Then came forth Sir Bors, and said, Queen Guinevere is in the right, and that will I prove with my hands. With that they both departed to their tents to make ready for the battle. But Sir Bors tarried long, hoping Sir Lancelot would come, till Sir Mador cried out to King Arthur, Bid thy champion come forth, unless he dare not. Then was Sir Bors ashamed, and took his horse, and rode to the end of the lists. But ere he could meet Sir Mador, he was ware of a knight upon a white horse, armed at all points, and with a strange shield, who rode to him and said, I pray you withdraw from this quarrel, for it is mine, and I have ridden far to fight in it. Thereat Sir Bors rode to King Arthur, and told him that another knight was come, who would do battle for the queen. "'Who is he?' said King Arthur. "'I may not tell you,' said Sir Bors. "'But he made a covenant with me to be here to-day, wherefore I am discharged.' Then the king called that knight, and asked him if he would fight for the queen. "'Therefore came I hither, Sir King,' answered he. But let us tarry no longer, for anon I have other matters to do. But wit ye well, said he to the knights of the round table, it is shame to ye for such a courteous queen to suffer this dishonour. And all men marvelled who this knight might be, for none knew him save Sir Bors. Then Sir Mador and the knight rode to either end of the lists, and couching their spears ran one against the other with all their might, and Sir Mador's spear broke short, but the strange knight bore both him and his horse down to the ground. Then lightly they leaped from their saddles and drew their swords, and so came eagerly to the battle, and either gave the other many sad strokes and sore and deep wounds. Thus they fought nigh an hour, for Sir Mador was a full strong and valiant knight. But at last the strange knight smote him to the earth, and gave him such a buffet on the helm as well nigh killed him. Then did Sir Mador yield, and prayed his life. "'I will but grant it thee,' said the strange knight, "'if thou wilt release the queen from this quarrel for ever, and promise that no mention shall be made upon Sir Patrice's tomb that ever she consented to that treason.' "'All this shall be done,' said Sir Mador. Then the knight's parters took up Sir Mador, and led him to his tent, 
and the other knight went straight to the stair foot of King Arthur's throne, and by that time was the queen come to the king again, and kissed him lovingly. Then both the king and she stooped down and thanked the knight, and prayed him to put off his helm and rest him, and to take a cup of wine. And when he put his helmet off to drink, all people saw it was Sir Lancelot. But when the queen beheld him, she sank almost to the ground, weeping for sorrow and for joy that he had done her such great goodness, when she had shown him such unkindness. Then the knights of his blood gathered round him, and there was great joy and mirth in the court. And Sir Mador and Sir Lancelot were soon healed of their wounds, and not long after came the Lady of the Lake to the court, and told all there, by her enchantments, how Sir Pinel, and not the queen, was guilty of Sir Patrice's death, whereat the queen was held excused of all men, and Sir Pinel fled the country. So Sir Patrice was buried in the church of Winchester, and it was written on his tomb that Sir Pinel slew him with a poisoned apple in error for Sir Gawain. And through Sir Lancelot's favor, the queen was reconciled to Sir Mador, and all was forgiven. Now fifteen days before the feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, the king proclaimed attorney to be held that feast day at Camelot, whereat himself and the king of Scotland would joust with all who should come against them. So thither went the king of North Wales, and King Anguish of Ireland, and Sir Galahout, the noble prince, and many other nobles of diverse countries. And King Arthur made ready to go, and would have had the queen go with him. But she said that she was sick. Sir Lancelot also made excuses, saying he was not yet whole of his wounds. At that the king was passing heavy and grieved, and so departed alone towards Camelot. And by the way he lodged in a town called Astolat, and lay that night in the castle. As soon as he had gone, Sir Lancelot said to the queen, This night I will rest, and to-morrow betimes will I take my way to Camelot, for at these jousts I will be against the king and his fellowship. Ye may do as ye list, said Queen Guinevere, but by my counsel ye will not be against the king, for in his company are many hardy knights, as ye well know. Madam, said Sir Lancelot, I pray ye not be displeased with me, for I will take the adventure that God may send me. And on the morrow he went to the church, and heard mass, and took his leave of the queen, and so departed. Then he rode long till he came to Astolat, and there lodged at the castle of an old baron called sir bernard of astolat which was near the castle where king arthur lodged and as sir lancelot entered the king espied him and knew him then said he to the knights i have just seen a knight who will fight full well at the joust toward which we go who is it asked they as yet ye shall not know he answered smiling when Sir Lancelot was in his chamber, unarming, the old baron came to him, saluting him, though as yet he knew not who he was. Now Sir Bernard had a daughter, passing beautiful, called the Fair Maid of Astolat, and when she saw Sir Lancelot she loved him from that instant with her whole heart, and could not stay from gazing on him. On the morrow Sir Lancelot asked the old baron to lend him a strange shield, for, said he, I would be unknown. Sir, said his host, ye shall have your desire, for here is the shield of my eldest son, Sir Torre, who was hurt the day he was made knight, so that he cannot ride, and his shield, therefore, is not known. And if it please you, my youngest son, Sir Lavaine, shall ride with you to the jousts, for he is of his age full strong and mighty, and I deem ye be a noble knight, wherefore I pray ye, tell me your name. As to that, said Sir Lancelot, ye must hold me excused at this time, but if I speed well at the jousts, I will come again and tell you. But in any wise, let me have your son, Sir Lavaine, with me, and lend me his brother's shield. Then, ere they departed, came Elaine, the baron's daughter, and said to Sir Lancelot, I pray thee, gentle knight, to wear my token at to-morrow's tourney. 
"'If I should grant you that, fair damsel,' said he, "'ye might say that I did more for you than ever I have done for lady or damsel.' Then he bethought him that if he granted her request he would be the more disguised, for never before had he worn any lady's token. So anon he said, "'Fair damsel, I will wear thy token on my helmet, if thou wilt show it me.' Thereat was she passing glad, and brought him a scarlet sleeve broidered with pearls, which Sir Lancelot took and put upon his helm. Then he prayed her to keep his shield for him until he came again, and taking Sir Torre's shield instead, rode forth with Sir Lavaine toward Camelot. On the morrow the trumpets blew for the tourney, and there was a great press of dukes and earls and barons and many noble knights, and King Arthur sat in a gallery to behold who did the best. So the King of Scotland and his knights, and King Anguish of Ireland, rode forth on King Arthur's side, and against them came the King of North Wales, the King of a Hundred Knights, the King of Northumberland, and the noble prince Sir Galahout. But Sir Lancelot and Sir Lavaine rode into a little wood behind the party which was against King Arthur, to watch which side should prove the weakest. Then was there a strong fight between the two parties, for the King of a Hundred Knights smote down the King of Scotland, and Sir Palamedes, who was on King Arthur's side, overthrew Sir Galahout. Then came fifteen knights of the Round Table, and beat back the kings of Northumberland and North Wales with their knights. Now, said Sir Lancelot to Sir Lavaine, if ye will help me, ye shall see yonder fellowship go back as fast as they came. Sir, said Sir Lavaine, I will do what I can. Then they rode together into the thickest of the press, and there with one spear Sir Lancelot smote down five knights of the round table one after the other, and Sir Lavaine overthrew two. And taking another spear, for his own was broken, Sir Lancelot smote down four more knights, and Sir Lavaine a fifth. Then drawing his sword, Sir Lancelot fought fiercely on the right hand and the left, and unhorsed Sir Sapphire, Sir Epinogris, and Sir Galeron. At that the knights of the round table withdrew themselves as well as they were able. Now mercy, said Sir Gawain, who sat by King Arthur, what knight is that who doth such marvellous deeds of arms? I should deem him by his force to be Sir Lancelot, but that he wears a lady's token on his helm, as never Lancelot doth. Let him be, said King Arthur. He will be better known, and do more ere he depart. Thus the party against King Arthur prospered at this time, and his knights were sore ashamed. Then Sir Bors, Sir Ector, and Sir Lionel called together the knights of their blood, nine in number, and agreed to join together in one band against the two strange knights. So they encountered Sir Lancelot all at once, and by main force smote his horse to the ground, and by misfortune Sir Bors struck Sir Lancelot through the shield into the side, and the spear broke off, and left the head in the wound. When Sir Lavaine saw that, he ran to the King of Scotland, and struck him off his horse, and brought it to Sir Lancelot, and helped him to mount. Then Sir Lancelot bore Sir Bors and his horse to the ground, and in like manner served Sir Ector and Sir Lionel, and turning upon three other knights he smote them down also, while Sir Lavaine did many gallant deeds. But feeling himself now sorely wounded, Sir Lancelot drew his sword and proffered to fight with Sir Bors, who by this time was mounted anew, and as they met, Sir Ector and Sir Lionel came also, and the swords of all three drave fiercely against him. When he felt their buffets and his wound that was so grievous, he determined to do all his best while he could yet endure and smote Sir Bors a blow that bent his head down nearly to the ground, and raised his helmet off, and pulled him from his horse. Then rushing at Sir Ector and Sir Lionel, he smote them down, and might have slain all three, but when he saw their faces his heart forbade him. Leaving them therefore on the field, he hurled into the thickest of the press, and did such feats of arms as never were beheld before and Sir Lavaine was with him through it all, and overthrew ten knights. But Sir Lancelot smote down more than thirty, and most of them knights of the round table. 
then the king ordered the trumpets to blow for the end of the tourney and the prize to be given by the heralds to the knight with the white shield who bore the red sleeve but ere sir lancelot was found by the heralds came the king of the hundred knights the king of north wales the king of northumberland and sir galahout and said to him fair knights god bless thee for much have ye done this day for us wherefore we pray ye come with us and receive the honour and the prize as ye have worshipfully deserved it my fair lords said sir lancelot wit ye well if i have deserved thanks i have sore bought them for i am like never to escape with my life therefore i pray ye let me depart for i am sore hurt i take no thought of honour for i had rather rest me than be lord of all the world and therewith he groaned piteously and rode a great gallop away from them and sir lavaine rode after him sad at heart for the broken spear still stuck fast in sir lancelot's side and the blood streamed sorely from the wound anon they came near a wood more than a mile from the lists where he knew he could be hidden then said he to sir lavaine o oh, gentle knight help me to pull out this spearhead from my side for the pain thereof nigh killeth me dear lord said he i fain would help ye but i dread to draw it forth lest ye should die for loss of blood i charge you as you love me said sir lancelot draw it out so they dismounted and with a mighty wrench sir lavaine drew the spear forth from sir lancelot's side whereat he gave a marvellous great shriek and ghastly groan and all his blood leaped forth in a full stream then he sank swooning to the earth with a visage pale as death alas cried sir lavaine what shall i do now and then he turned his master's face toward the wind and sat by him nigh half an hour while he lay quiet as one dead but at the last he lifted up his eyes and said i pray ye bear me on my horse again and lead me to a hermit who dwelleth within two miles hence for he was formerly a knight of arthur's court and now hath mighty skill in medicine and herbs so with great pain sir lavaine got him on his horse and led him to the hermitage within the wood beside a stream and knocked he with his spear upon the door and prayed to enter at that a child came out to whom he said fair child pray the good man thy master to come hither and let in a knight who is sore wounded anon came out the knight hermit whose name was sir baldwin and asked who is this wounded knight i know not said sir lavaine save that he is the noblest knight i ever met with and hath done this day such marvellous deeds of arms against king arthur that he hath won the prize of the tourney then the hermit gazed long on sir lancelot and hardly knew him so pale he was with bleeding yet said he at the last who art thou lord sir lancelot answered feebly i am a stranger knight adventurous who laboureth through many realms to win worship why hidest thou thy name dear lord from me cried sir baldwin for in sooth i know thee now to be the noblest knight in all the world my lord sir lancelot du lac with whom i long had fellowship at the round table since ye know me fair sir said he i pray ye for christ's sake to help me if ye may doubt not replied he that ye shall live and fare right well then he staunched his wound and gave him strong medicines and cordials till he was refreshed from his faintness and came to himself again now after the jousting was done king arthur held a feast and asked to see the knight with the red sleeve that he might take the prize so they told him how that knight had ridden from the field wounded nigh to death these be the worst tidings i have heard for many years cried out the king i would not for all my kingdom he were slain then all men asked know ye him lord i may not tell ye at this time said he but would to god we had good tidings of him then sir gawain prayed leave to go and seek that knight which the king gladly gave him 
So forthwith he mounted and rode many leagues round Camelot, but could hear no tidings. Within two days thereafter King Arthur and his knights returned from Camelot, and Sir Gawain chanced to lodge at Astolat in the house of Sir Bernard. And there came in the fair Elaine to him, and prayed him news of the tournament, and who won the prize. A knight with a white shield, said he, who bare a red sleeve in his helm, smote down all comers, and won the day. At that the visage of Elaine changed suddenly from white to red, and heartily she thanked Our Lady. Then said Sir Gawain, Know ye that knight? And urged her till she told him that it was her sleeve he wore. So Sir Gawain knew it was for love that she had given it, and when he heard she kept his proper shield, he prayed to see it. As soon as it was brought, he saw Sir Lancelot's arms thereon, and cried, Alas, now am I heavier of heart than ever yet. Wherefore? said the fair Elaine. Fair damsel, answered he, know ye not that the knight ye love is of all knights the noblest of the world, Sir Lancelot du Lac? With all my heart I pray ye may have joy of each other, but hardly dare I think that ye shall see him in this world again, for he is so sore wounded he may scarcely live, and is gone out of sight where none can find him. Then was Elaine nigh mad with grief and sorrow, and with piteous words she prayed her father that she might go seek Sir Lancelot and her brother. So in the end her father gave her leave, and she departed. And on the morrow came Sir Gawain to the court, and told how he had found Sir Lancelot's shield in Elaine's keeping, and how it was her sleeve which he had worn, whereat all marvelled, for Sir Lancelot had done for her more than he had ever done for any woman. But when Queen Guinevere heard it, she was beside herself with wrath, and sending privily for Sir Bors, who sorrowed sorely that through him Sir Lancelot had been hurt. "'Have ye now heard?' said she, how falsely Sir Lancelot hath betrayed me. I beseech thee, madam, said he, speak not so, for else I may not hear thee. Shall I not call him traitor, cried she, who hath worn another lady's token at the jousting? Be sure he did it, madam, for no ill intent, replied Sir Bors, but that he might be better hidden, for never did he in that wise before. Now shame on him, and thee who wouldst help him cried the queen. Madam, say what ye will, said he, but I must haste to seek him, and God send me soon good tidings of him. So with that he departed to find Sir Lancelot. Now Elaine had ridden with full haste from Astolat, and came to Camelot, and there she sought throughout the country for any news of Lancelot. And so it chanced that Sir Lavaine was riding near the hermitage to exercise his horse, and when she saw him she ran up and cried aloud, How doth my lord Sir Lancelot fare? Then said Sir Lavaine, marvelling greatly, How know ye my lord's name, fair sister? So she told him how Sir Gawain had lodged with Sir Bernard, and knew Sir Lancelot's shield. Then prayed she to see his lord forthwith, and when she came to the hermitage, and found him lying there sore, sick, and bleeding, she swooned for sorrow. Anon, as she revived, Sir Lancelot kissed her, and said, Fair maid, I pray ye take comfort, for by God's grace I shall be shortly whole of this wound. And if ye be come to tend me, I am heartily bounden to your great kindness. Yet was he sore vexed to hear Sir Gawain had discovered him, for he knew Queen Guinevere would be full wroth because of the red sleeve. So Elaine rested in the hermitage, and ever night and day she watched and waited on Sir Lancelot, and would let none other tend him. And as she saw him more, the more she set her love upon him, and could by no means withdraw it. Then said Sir Lancelot to Sir Lavaine, I pray thee set some to watch for the good knight Sir Bors, for as he hurt me, so will he surely seek for me. Now Sir Bors by this time had come to Camelot, and was seeking for Sir Lancelot everywhere, so Sir Lavaine soon found him, and brought him to the hermitage. And when he saw Sir Lancelot pale and feeble, he wept for pity and sorrow that he had given him that grievous wound. 
God send thee a right speedy cure, dear lord, said he, for I am of all men most unhappy to have wounded thee, who art our leader, and the noblest knight in all the world. Fair cousin, said Sir Lancelot, be comforted, for I have but gained what I sought, and it was through pride that I was hurt, for had I warned ye of my coming, it had not been. Wherefore let us speak of other things. So they talked long together, and Sir Bors told him of the queen's anger. Then he asked Sir Lancelot, Was it from this maid who tendeth you so lovingly ye had the token? Yea, said Sir Lancelot, and would I could persuade her to withdraw her love from me. Why should you do so? said Sir Bors, for she is passing fair and loving. I would to heaven ye could love her. That may not be, replied he, but it repenteth me in sooth to grieve her. Then they talked of other matters, and of the great jousting at All Hallowtide next coming between King Arthur and the King of North Wales. Abide with me till then, said Sir Lancelot, for by that time I trust to be all whole again, and we will go together. So Elaine, daily and nightly tending him, within a month he felt so strong he deemed himself full cured. Then on a day when Sir Bors and Sir Lavaine were from the hermitage, and the night hermit was also gone forth, Sir Lancelot prayed Elaine to bring him some herbs from the forest. When she was gone, he rose and made haste to arm himself, and try if he were whole enough to joust, and mounted on his horse, which was fresh with lack of labor for so long a time. But when he set his spear in the rest, and tried his armor, the horse bounded and leaped beneath him, so that Sir Lancelot strained to keep him back, and therewith his wound, which was not wholly healed, burst forth again, and with a mighty groan he sank down swooning on the ground. At that came fair Elaine, and wept and piteously moaned to see him lying so, and when Sir Bors and Sir Lavaine came back she called them traitors to let him rise, or to know any rumour of the tournament. Anon the hermit returned, and was wroth to see Sir Lancelot risen, but within a while he recovered him from his swoon, and staunched the wound. Then Sir Lancelot told him how he had risen of his own will to assay his strength for the tournament, but the hermit bade him rest, and let Sir Bors go alone, for else would he sorely peril his life, and Elaine, with tears, prayed him in the same wise, so that Sir Lancelot, in the end, consented. So Sir Bors departed to the tournament, and there he did such feats of arms that the prize was given between him and Sir Gawain, who did like valiantly. And when all was over, he came back and told Sir Lancelot, and found him so nigh well that he could rise and walk. And within a while thereafter he departed from the hermitage, and went with Sir Bors, Sir Lavaine, and Fair Elaine to Astolat, where Sir Bernard joyfully received them. But after they had lodged there a few days, Sir Lancelot and Sir Bors must needs depart and return to King Arthur's court. So when Elaine knew Sir Lancelot must go, she came to him and said, Have mercy on me, fair knight, and let me not die for your love. Then said Sir Lancelot, very sad at heart, Fair maid, what would ye that I should do for you? If I may not be your wife, dear lord, she answered, I must die. Alas, said he, I pray heaven that may not be, for in sooth I may not be your husband. But fain would I show ye what thankfulness I can for all your love and kindness to me, and ever will I be your knight, fair maiden, and if it chance that ye shall ever wed some noble knight, right heartily will I give ye such a dower as half my lands will bring. Alas, what shall that aid me, answered she, for I must die. And therewith she fell to the earth in a deep swoon. Then was Sir Lancelot passing heavy of heart, and said to Sir Bernard and Sir Lavaine, What shall I do for her? Alas, said Sir Bernard, I know well that she will die for your sake. And Sir Lavaine said, I marvel not that she so sorely mourneth your departure, 
for truly I do as she doth, and since I once have seen you, Lord, I cannot leave you. So anon, with a full sorrowful heart, Sir Lancelot took his leave, and Sir Lavaine rode with him to the court, and King Arthur and the knights of the round table joyed greatly to see him whole of his wound, but Queen Guinevere was sorely wroth and neither spake with him nor greeted him. Now when Sir Lancelot had departed, the maid of Astolat could neither eat nor drink nor sleep for sorrow, and having thus endured ten days, she felt within herself that she must die. Then sent she for a holy man, and was shriven and received the sacrament. But when he told her she must leave her earthly thoughts, she answered, Am I not an earthly woman? What sin is it to love the noblest knight of all the world? And by my truth I am not able to withstand the love whereof I die. Wherefore I pray the High Father of Heaven to have mercy on my soul. Then she besought Sir Bernard to indite a letter as she should devise, and said, When I am dead, put this within my hand, and dress me in my fairest clothes, and lay me in a barge all covered with black samite, and steer it down the river till it reach the court. Thus, father, I beseech thee, let it be. Then, full of grief, he promised her it should be so. And anon she died, and all the household made bitter lamentation over her. Then did they as she had desired, and laid her body richly dressed upon a bed within the barge, and a trusty servant steered it down the river towards the court. Now King Arthur and Queen Guinevere sat at a window of the palace, and saw the barge come floating with the tide, and marvelled what was laid therein, and sent a messenger to see, who soon returning prayed them to come forth. When they came to the shore they marvelled greatly, and the king asked of the serving-men who steered the barge what this might mean but he made signs that he was dumb, and pointed to the letter in the damsel's hands. So King Arthur took the letter from the hand of the corpse, and found thereon written, To the noble knight, Sir Lancelot du Lac. Then was Sir Lancelot sent for, and the letter read aloud by a clerk, and thus it was written, Most noble knight, my lord Sir Lancelot, now hath death for ever parted us. I, whom men call the maid of Astolat, set my love upon you, and have died for your sake. This is my last request, that ye pray for my soul, and give me burial. Grant me this, Sir Lancelot, as thou art a peerless knight. At these words the queen and all the knights wept sore for pity. Then said Sir Lancelot, my lord, I am right heavy for the death of this fair damsel, and God knoweth that right unwillingly I caused it, for she was good as she was fair, and much was I beholden to her. But she loved me beyond measure, and asked me that I could not give her. Ye might have shown her gentleness enough to save her life, answered the queen. Madam, said he, she would but be repaid by my taking her to wife, and that I could not grant her, for love cometh of the heart, and not by constraint. That is true, said the king, for love is free. I pray you, said Sir Lancelot, let me now grant her last asking, to be buried by me. So on the morrow he caused her body to be buried richly and solemnly, and ordained masses for her soul, and made great sorrow over her. Then the queen sent for Sir Lancelot, and prayed his pardon for her wrath against him without cause. "'This is not the first time it hath been so,' answered he. "'Yet must I ever bear with ye, and so do I now forgive you.' So Queen Guinevere and Sir Lancelot were made friends again, but anon such favour did she show him, as in the end brought many evils on them both and all the realm. End of chapter 13 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 14 of The Legends of King Arthur and His Knights by James Nobles 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 The War Between King Arthur and Sir Lancelot, and the Death of King Arthur. Within a while thereafter was a jousting at the court wherein Sir Lancelot won the prize, and two of those he smote down were Sir Agravain, the brother of Sir Gawain, and Sir Modred, his false brother, King Arthur's son by Bellicent. And because of his victory they hated Sir Lancelot, and sought how they might injure him. So on a night when King Arthur was hunting in the forest, and the queen sent for Sir Lancelot to her chamber, they too espied him, and thinking now to make a scandal and a quarrel between Lancelot and the king, they found twelve others, and said Sir Lancelot was ever now in the queen's chamber, and King Arthur was dishonoured. Then all armed, they came suddenly round the queen's door, and cried, Traitor, now art thou taken. Madam, we be betrayed, said Sir Lancelot, yet shall my life cost these men dear. Then did the queen weep sore, and dismally she cried, Alas, there is no armour here whereby ye might withstand so many, wherefore ye will be slain, and I be burnt for the dread crime they will charge on me. But while she spake, the shouting of the knights was heard without, Traitor, come forth, for now thou art snared. Better were twenty deaths at once than this vile outcry, said Sir Lancelot. Then he kissed her, and said, Most noble lady, I beseech ye, as I have ever been your own true knight, take courage, pray for my soul, if I be now slain, and trust my faithful friends Sir Bors and Sir Lavaine to save you from the fire. But ever bitterly she wept and moaned and cried, Would God that they would take and slay me, and that thou couldst escape. That shall never be, said he and wrapping his mantle round his arm, he unbarred the door a little space, so that but one could enter. Then first rushed in Sir Chalance, a full strong knight, and lifted up his sword to smite Sir Lancelot, but lightly he avoided him, and struck Sir Chalance with his hand such a sore buffet on the head as felled him dead upon the floor. Then Sir Lancelot pulled in his body, and barred the door again, and dressed himself in his armor, and took his drawn sword in his hand. But still the knights cried mightily without the door, Traitor, come forth! Be silent and depart, replied Sir Lancelot, for be ye sure ye will not take me, and to-morrow will I meet ye face to face before the king. Ye shall have no such grace, they cried, but we will slay thee, or take thee as we list. Then save yourselves who may, he thundered, and therewith suddenly unbarred the door, and rushed forth at them, and at the first blow he slew Sir Agravaine, and after him twelve other knights, with twelve more mighty buffets, and none of all escaped him save Sir Modred, who, sorely wounded, fled away for life. Then returned he to the queen, and said, Now, madam, will I depart, and if ye be in any danger, I pray ye come to me. Surely I will stay here, for I am queen, she answered. Yet if to-morrow any harm come to me, I trust to thee for rescue. Have ye no doubt of me, said he, for ever while I live am I your own true knight. Therewith he took his leave, and went and told Sir Bors and all his kindred of this adventure. "'We will be with thee in this quarrel,' said they all, "'and if the queen be sentenced to the fire, we certainly will save her.' Meanwhile Sir Modred, in great fear and pain, fled from the court, and rode until he found King Arthur, and told him all that had befallen. But the king would scarce believe him, till he came and saw the bodies of Sir Agravaine and all the other knights. Then felt he in himself that all was true, and with his passing grief his heart nigh broke. Alas, cried he, now is the fellowship of the round table for ever broken. Yea, woe is me, I may not with my honour spare my queen. Anon it was ordained that Queen Guinevere should be burned to death, because she had dishonoured King Arthur. But when Sir Gawain heard thereof, he came before the king, and said, 
my lord i counsel thee be not too hasty in this matter but stay the judgment of the queen for a season for it may well be that sir lancelot was in her chamber for no evil seeing she is greatly beholden to him for so many deeds done for her sake and peradventure she had sent to him to thank him, and did it secretly that she might avoid slander. But the king answered, full of grief, Alas, I may not help her. She is judged as any other woman. Then he required Sir Gawain, and his brethren, Sir Gaharis, and Sir Gareth, to be ready to bear the queen to-morrow to the place of execution. Nay, noble lord, replied Sir Gawain, that can I never do for neither will my heart suffer me to see the queen die, nor shall men ever say I was of your counsel in this matter. Then said his brothers, Ye may command us to be there, but since it is against our will, we will be without arms, that we may do no battle against her. So on the morrow was Queen Guinevere led forth to die by fire, and a mighty crowd was there of knights and nobles, armed and unarmed, and all the lords and ladies wept sore at that piteous sight. Then was she shriven by a priest, and the men came nigh to bind her to the stake, and light the fire. At that Sir Lancelot's spies rode hastily, and told him and his kindred, who lay hidden in a wood hard by, and suddenly with twenty knights he rushed into the midst of all the throng to rescue her. But certain of King Arthur's knights rose up and fought with them, and there was a full great battle and confusion, and Sir Lancelot drave fiercely here and there among the press, and smote on every side, and at every blow struck down a knight, so that many were slain by him and his fellows. Then was the queen set free, and caught up on Sir Lancelot's saddle, and fled away with him and all his company to the castle of La Joyous Guard. Now so it chanced that in the turmoil of the fighting, Sir Lancelot had unawares struck down and slain the two good knights, Sir Gareth and Sir Gaharis, knowing it not, for he fought wildly and saw not that they were unarmed. When King Arthur heard thereof, and of all that battle, and the rescue of the queen, he sorrowed heavily for those good knights, and was passing wroth with Lancelot and the queen. But when Sir Gawain heard of his brethren's death, he swooned for sorrow and wrath, for he wist that Sir Lancelot had killed them in malice, and as soon as he recovered he ran into the king, and said, Lord King and uncle, hear this oath which now I swear, that from this day I will not fail Sir Lancelot till one of us hath slain the other. And now, unless ye haste to war with him, that we may be avenged, will I myself alone go after him. Then the king, full of wrath and grief, agreed thereto, and sent letters throughout the realm to summon all his knights, and went with a vast army to besiege the castle of La Joyous Guard. And Sir Lancelot with his knights mightily defended it, but never would he suffer any to go forth and attack one of the king's army, for he was right loath to fight against him. So when fifteen weeks were past, and King Arthur's army wasted itself in vain against the castle, for it was passing strong, it chanced upon a day Sir Lancelot was looking from the walls, and espied King Arthur and Sir Gawain close beside. "'Come forth, Sir Lancelot,' said King Arthur right fiercely, "'and let us two meet in the midst of the field.' "'God forbid that I should encounter with thee, Lord, for thou didst make me a knight,' replied Sir Lancelot. Then cried Sir Gawain, "'Shame on thee, traitor and false knights! Yet be ye well assured, we will regain the queen, and slay thee and thy company. Yea, double shame on ye, to slay my brother Gaharis unarmed, Sir Gareth also, who loved ye so well.' For that treachery be sure I am thine enemy till death. Alas, cried Sir Lancelot, that I hear such tidings, for I knew not I had slain those noble knights, and right sorely now do I repent it with a heavy heart. Yet abate thy wrath, Sir Gawain, for ye know full well I did it by mischance, for I loved them ever as my own brothers. Thou liest, false recreant, cried Sir Gawain fiercely. 
At that Sir Lancelot was wroth, and said, I see well thou art now mine enemy, and that there can be no more peace with thee or with my lord the king, else would I gladly give back the queen. Then the king would fain have listened to Sir Launcelot, for more than all his own wrong did he grieve at the sore waste and damage of the realm, but Sir Gawain persuaded him against it, and ever cried out foully on Sir Launcelot. When Sir Bors and the other knights of Launcelot's party heard the fierce words of Sir Gawain, they were passing wroth, and prayed to ride forth and be avenged on him for they were weary of so long waiting to no good. And in the end Sir Launcelot, with a heavy heart, consented. So on the morrow the hosts on either side met in the field, and there was a great battle, and Sir Gawain prayed his knights chiefly to set upon Sir Launcelot, but Sir Launcelot commanded his company to forbear King Arthur and Sir Gawain. So the two armies jousted together right fiercely, and Sir Gawain proffered to encounter with Sir Lionel and overthrew him. But Sir Bors and Sir Blamor and Sir Palamedes, who were on Sir Launcelot's side, did great feats of arms and overthrew many of King Arthur's knights. Then the king came forth against Sir Launcelot, but Sir Launcelot forbore him and would not strike again. At that Sir Bors rode up against the king, and smote him down. But Sir Launcelot cried, Touch him not on pain of thy head. And going to King Arthur, he alighted, and gave him his own horse, saying, My lord, I pray thee forbear this strife, for it can bring to neither of us any honour. And when King Arthur looked on him, the tears came to his eyes, as he thought of his noble courtesy, and he said within himself, Alas, that ever this war began! But on the morrow Sir Gawain led forth the army again, and Sir Bors commanded on Sir Launcelot's side, and they two struck together so fiercely that both fell to the ground, sorely wounded, and all the day they fought, till night fell, and many were slain on both sides, yet in the end neither gained the victory. But by now the fame of this fierce war spread through all Christendom, and when the Pope heard thereof, he sent a bull and charged King Arthur to make peace with Launcelot and receive back Queen Guinevere, and for the offence imputed to her absolution should be given by the Pope. Thereto would King Arthur straightway have obeyed, but Sir Gawain ever urged him to refuse. When Sir Launcelot heard thereof, he wrote thus to the king, It was never in my thought, lord, to withhold thy queen from thee, but since she was condemned for my sake to death, I deemed it but a just and knightly part to rescue her therefrom. Wherefore I recommend me to your grace, and within eight days will I come to thee and bring the queen in safety. Then within eight days, as he had said, Sir Launcelot rode from out the castle with Queen Guinevere and a hundred knights for company, each carrying an olive branch in sign of peace. And so they came to the court, and found King Arthur sitting on his throne, with Sir Gawain and many other knights around him. And when Sir Launcelot entered with the queen, they both kneeled down before the king. Anon Sir Launcelot rose and said, my lord, I have brought hither my lady the queen again, as right requireth, and by commandment of the pope and you. I pray ye take her to your heart again, and forget the past. For myself I may ask nothing, and for my sin I shall have sorrow and sore punishment. Yet I would to heaven I might have your grace. But ere the king could answer, for he was moved with pity at his words, Sir Gawain cried aloud, Let the king do as he will, but be sure, Sir Launcelot, thou and I shall never be accorded while we live, for thou hast slain my brethren traitorously and unarmed. As heaven is my help, replied Sir Launcelot, I did it ignorantly, for I loved them well, and while I live I shall bewail their death. But to make war with me were no avail, for I must needs fight with thee if thou assailest, and peradventure I might kill thee also, which I were right loath to do. I will forgive thee never, 
cried Sir Gawain, and if the king accordeth with thee, he shall lose my service. Then the knights who stood near tried to reconcile Sir Gawain to Sir Lancelot, but he would not hear them. Though at the last Sir Lancelot said, Since peace is vain, I will depart, lest I bring more evil on my fellowship. And as he turned to go, the tears fell from him, and he said, Alas, most noble Christian realm, which I have loved above all others, now shall I see thee never more. Then said he to the queen, Madam, now must I leave ye and this noble fellowship for ever, and I beseech ye pray for me, and if ye ever be defamed of any, let me hear thereof, and as I have been ever thy true knight in right and wrong, so will I be again. With that he kneeled and kissed King Arthur's hands, and departed on his way and there was none in all that court save Sir Gawain alone, but wept to see him go. Though he returned with all his knights to the castle of La Joyous Guard, and for his sorrow's sake he named it Dolores Guard thenceforth. Anon he left the realm, and went with many of his fellowship beyond the sea to France, and there divided all his lands among them equally, he sharing but as the rest. And from that time forward, peace had been between him and King Arthur, but for Sir Gawain, who left the king no rest, but constantly persuaded him that Lancelot was raising mighty hosts against him. Though in the end his malice overcame the king, who left the government in charge of Modred, and made him guardian of the queen, and went with a great army to invade Sir Lancelot's lands, Yet Sir Lancelot would make no war upon the king, and sent a message to gain peace on any terms King Arthur chose. But Sir Gawain met the herald ere he reached the king, and sent him back with taunting and bitter words. Whereat Sir Lancelot sorrowfully called his knights together, and fortified the castle of Benwick, and there was shortly besieged by the army of King Arthur. And every day Sir Gawain rode up to the walls and cried out foully on Sir Lancelot, till upon a time Sir Lancelot answered him that he would meet him in the field and put his boasting to the proof. So it was agreed on both sides that there should none come nigh them nor separate them till one had fallen or yielded, and they too rode forth. Then did they wheel their horses apart, and turning came together as it had been thunder, so that both horses fell, and both their lances broke. At that they drew their swords, and set upon each other fiercely with passing grievous strokes. Now Sir Gawain had through magic a marvellous great gift, for every day from morning till noon his strength waxed to the might of seven men, but after that waned to his natural force. Therefore till noon he gave Sir Lancelot many mighty buffets, which scarcely he endured. Yet greatly he forbore Sir Gawain, for he was aware of his enchantment, and smote him slightly till his own knights marvelled. But after noon Sir Gawain's strength sank fast, and then with one full blow Sir Lancelot laid him on the earth. Then Sir Gawain cried out, Turn not away, thou traitor knight, but slay me if thou wilt, or else I will arise and fight with thee again some other time. Sir knight, replied Sir Launcelot, I never yet smote a fallen man. At that they bore Sir Gawain sorely wounded to his tent, and King Arthur withdrew his men, for he was loath to shed the blood of so many knights of his own fellowship. But now came tidings to King Arthur from across the sea, which caused him to return in haste. For thus the news ran, that no sooner was Sir Modred set up in his regency than he had forged false tidings from abroad that the king had fallen in a battle with Sir Lancelot, whereat he had proclaimed himself the king and had been crowned at Canterbury, where he had held a coronation feast for fifteen days. Then he had gone to Winchester, where Queen Guinevere abode, and had commanded her to be his wife, 
whereto for fear and sore perplexity she had feigned consent but under pretext of preparing for the marriage had fled in haste to london and taken shelter in the tower fortifying it and providing it with all manner of victuals and defending it against sir modred and answering to all his threats that she would rather slay herself than be his queen thus was it written to king arthur then in passing great wrath and haste he came with all his army swiftly back from france and sailed to england but when sir modred heard thereof he left the tower and marched with all his host to meet the king at dover then fled queen guinevere to amesbury to a nunnery and there she clothed herself in sackcloth and spent her time in praying for the king and in good deeds and fasting and in that nunnery evermore she lived sorely repenting and mourning for her sin and for the ruin she had brought on all the realm and there anon she died and when sir lancelot heard thereof he put his knightly armour off and bade farewell to all his kin and went a mighty pilgrimage for many years and after lived a hermit till his death when sir modred came to dover he found king arthur and his army but just landed and there they fought a fierce and bloody battle and many great and noble knights fell on both sides but the king's side had the victory for he was beyond himself with might and passion and all his knights so fiercely followed him that in spite of all their multitude they drove sir modred's army back with fearful wounds and slaughter and slept that night upon the battlefield but sir gawain was smitten by an arrow in the wound sir lancelot gave him and wounded to the death then was he borne to the king's tent and King Arthur sorrowed over him, as it had been his own son. Alas, said he, in Sir Lancelot and in you I had my greatest earthly joy, and now is all gone from me. And Sir Gawain answered with a feeble voice, My lord and king, I know well my death is come, and through my own willfulness, for I am smitten in the wound Sir Lancelot gave me alas that i have been the cause of all this war for but for me thou hadst been now at peace with lancelot and then had modred never done this treason i pray ye therefore my dear lord be now agreed with lancelot and tell him that although he gave me my death wound it was through my own seeking wherefore i beseech him to come back to england and here to visit my tomb and pray for my soul when he had thus spoken, Sir Gawain gave up his ghost, and the king grievously mourned for him. Then they told him that the enemy had camped on Barham Downs, whereat with all his hosts he straightway marched there, and fought again a bloody battle, and overthrew Sir Modred utterly. Howbeit he raised yet another army, and retreating ever from before the king, increased his numbers as he went till at the farthest west in Leoness he once more made a stand. Now on the night of Trinity Sunday, being the eve of the battle, King Arthur had a vision, and saw Sir Gawain in a dream, who warned him not to fight with Modred on the morrow, else he would be surely slain, and prayed him to delay till Lancelot and his knights should come to aid him. So when King Arthur woke, he told his lords and knights that vision, and all agreed to wait the coming of Sir Lancelot. Then a herald was sent with a message of truce to Sir Modred, and a treaty was made that neither army should assail the other. But when the treaty was agreed upon, and the heralds returned, King Arthur said to his knights, Beware, lest Sir Modred deceive us, for I in no wise trust him and if swords be drawn be ready to encounter and sir modred likewise gave an order that if any man of the king's army drew his sword they should begin to fight and as it chanced a knight of the king's side was bitten by an adder in the foot and hastily drew forth his sword to slay it that saw sir modred and forthwith commanded all his army to assail the king's 
So both sides rushed to battle and fought passing fiercely, and when the king saw there was no hope to stay them, he did right mightily and nobly as a king should do, and ever like a lion raged in the thickest of the press, and slew on the right hand and on the left, till his horse went fetlock deep in blood. So all day long they fought and stinted not, till many a noble knight was slain. But the king was passing sorrowful to see his trusty knights lie dead on every side, and at the last but two remained beside him, Sir Lucan and his brother Sir Bedivere, and both were sorely wounded. "'Now am I come to mine end,' said King Arthur. "'But, lo, that traitor Modred liveth yet, and I may not die till I have slain him. Now give me my spear, Sir Lucan.' lord let him be replied sir lucan for if it pass through this unhappy day ye shall be right well revenged upon him my good lord remember well your dream and what the spirit of sir gawain did forewarn ye betide me life betide me death said the king now i see him yonder alone he shall never escape my hands for at a better vantage shall i never have him god speed you well said Sir Bedivere. Then King Arthur got his spear in both his hands, and ran toward Sir Modred, crying, Traitor, now is thy death-day come! And when Sir Modred heard his words, and saw him come, he drew his sword, and stood to meet him. Then King Arthur smote Sir Modred through the body more than a fathom, and when Sir Modred felt he had his death-wound, he thrust himself with all his might up to the end of King Arthur's spear, and smote his father Arthur with his sword upon the head, so that it pierced both helm and brain-pan. And therewith Sir Modred fell down stark dead to the earth, and King Arthur fell down also in a swoon, and swooned many times. Then Sir Lucan and Sir Bedivere came and bare him away to a little chapel by the seashore, and there Sir Lucan sank down with the bleeding of his own wounds and fell dead. And King Arthur lay long in a swoon, and when he came to himself he found Sir Lucan lying dead beside him and Sir Bedivere weeping over the body of his brother. Then said the king to Sir Bedivere, Weeping will avail no longer, else would I grieve for evermore. Alas, now is the fellowship of the round table dissolved for ever, and all my realm I have so loved is wasted with war. But my time hieth fast, wherefore take thou Excalibur, my good sword, and go therewith to yonder waterside, and throw it in, and bring me word what thing thou seest. So Sir Bedivere departed, but as he went he looked upon the sword, the hilt whereof was all inlaid with precious stones exceeding rich, and presently he said within himself, If I now throw this sword into the water, what good should come of it? So he hid the sword among the reeds, and came again to the king. What sawest thou? said he to Sir Bedivere. Lord, said he, I saw nothing else but wind and waves thou hast untruly spoken said the king wherefore go lightly back and throw it in and spare not then sir bedivere returned again and took the sword up in his hand but when he looked on it he thought it sin and shame to throw away a thing so noble wherefore he hid it yet again and went back to the king what saw ye said king arthur lord answered he i saw nothing but the water ebbing and flowing o oh, traitor and untrue cried out the king twice hast thou now betrayed me art thou called of men a noble knight and wouldst betray me for a jewelled sword now therefore go again for the last time for thy tarrying hath put me in sore peril of my life and i fear my wound hath taken cold and if thou do it not this time, by my faith I will arise and slay thee with my hands. Then Sir Bedivere ran quickly, and took up the sword, and went down to the water's edge, and bound the girdle round the hilt, and threw it far into the water. And lo, 
and arm and hand came forth above the water and caught the sword and brandished it three times and vanished so sir bedivere came again to the king and told him what he had seen help me from hence said king arthur for i dread me i have tarried over long then sir bedivere took the king up in his arms and bore him to the water's edge and by the shore they saw a barge with three fair queens therein all dressed in black and when they saw king arthur they wept and wailed now put me in the barge said he to sir bedivere and tenderly he did so then the three queens received him and he laid his head upon the lap of one of them who cried alas dear brother why have ye tarried so long for your wound hath taken cold with that the barge put from the land and when sir bedivere saw it departing he cried with a bitter cry alas my lord king arthur what shall become of me now ye have gone from me comfort ye said king arthur and be strong for i may no more help ye i go to the vale of avilion to heal me of my grievous wound and if ye see me no more pray for my soul then the three queens kneeled down around the king and sorely wept and wailed and the barge went forth to sea and departed slowly out of sir bedivere's sight the end recording by thomas rose